Welcome to the Harvard Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, we have an extraordinary discussion ahead of us uh, with a panel of exceptional people discussing a topic of crucial importance. Um, I'll be very brief in my introduction so that um, you can hear from them. Uh, Nick Everstadt holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute. He has three degrees from Harvard, a bachelor's degree from the college, a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School, uh, and a PhD in political economy and government in, from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Um, he researches and writes on a broad and fascinating array of topics, including demographics and economic development, uh, national security on the Korean Peninsula and elsewhere in Asia, uh, and uh, on poverty and social well-being. You may have seen him testify or on TV or listen to him on the radio. Um, he consults with a wide range of uh, national agencies, international organizations. His latest book, published last year, is titled Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. And that is, of course, the inspiration for our discussion tonight. Uh, Jason Furman was the chairman of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors uh, for nearly four years, uh, serving as the president's chief economist uh, and a member of his cabinet. Uh, Jason played an important role in most of the major economic policies of the Obama administration. And under his leadership, the Council of Economic Advisors released a collection of very uh, interesting, uh, consequential reports on a broad range of issues in economic policy, uh, that both the economic challenges and the policy responses. Uh, Jason will be joining the faculty of the Kennedy School uh, this coming fall. Uh, and we are very uh, lucky that we persuaded him to do that I met Jason uh, many years ago, actually, in the waning uh, moments of the Clinton administration. When we worked on Social Security and other things together, and I'm delighted we'll have a chance to work together again. Uh, Larry Summers will lead the discussion. Uh, Larry needs uh, no introduction to this audience, or pretty much any audience I can imagine. Uh, Larry is uh, the Charles Elliott University professor at Harvard, and we are very fortunate that he's chosen the Kennedy School uh, as his base. Uh, Larry is a prodigious researcher on an uh, incomprehensibly wide array of topics, and he's also had a collection of the most senior economic policy jobs. Um, he was uh, Vice President uh, for Development Economics at the World Bank, Under Secretary of the Treasury uh, for International Affairs, uh, Director of the National Economic Council under President Obama, Secretary of the Treasury uh, under President Clinton, um, and in or out of public office. Larry is one of the most influential voices on economic policy in the world. Um, I met Larry uh, as a first-year graduate student um, a long time ago, uh, and I was, have been very lucky that he became uh, one of my dissertation advisors uh, and has been uh, a mentor uh, in much that I have done uh, throughout the last uh, 30 years of my life and career. Um, so we're all uh, honored and lucky to have uh, you three with us tonight, and I will turn this over to you, Larry. Thank you very much. Doug, thank you on behalf of all of us on uh, the panel for those uh, generous introductions. We only wish our parents had been here uh, to uh, hear them, and we appreciate very much. Uh, your, uh, your generosity. Let's get into it. Um, Nick, you, um, you called this America's invisible crisis. Some economists would say um, people choose to work, people choose not to work, there's a market, there's wages, people make their, uh, people make their choices, sure. the unemployment rate's four and a half percent, so it's not that there are people who are saying they want to work and not being able to work to an unusual degree, it's actually less of that uh, than uh, usual. Uh, why are you all hot and bothered about this? Thank you, Larry. It's great to be here with you, <laughs> and I also want to uh, thank Jason for putting out that terrific report with the CEA. You put a spotlight on this in a way that really no other institution, I think, in government has done, so kudos to you on that. Uh, it kind of drives me nuts to hear the happy talk uh, about how we're at full employment or nearly full employment, because there was an era, uh, let's say, when Charles Dickens was alive, 
uh, where there were basically two options for a guy with respect to employment status during his uh, working ages. You either had a job or you were looking for one. Now we, we've got a situation where there's kind of a third option, uh, neither working nor looking for work. And for the prime age guys, <clears throat> the 25 to 54s that are the kind of critical backbone uh, to the male part of the workforce, uh, there are three guys who are out of the workforce for every one guy who's unemployed. So as, when we talk about unemployment, we're kind of chasing the wrong rabbit, I think. If you look at the work rates, if you look at the unemployment rate, the employment to population ratio, it's lower now for 25 to 54s uh, than it was in 1940, at the tail end of the Depression. That's also true if you look at the 20 to 64s. So, you know, if we don't have a problem with the Depression, then I guess we shouldn't have a problem with where we are now, but they're kind of comparable in terms of the male employment rates. No, but wait, but in, in, the, in the other time, there was a lot of unemployment. Yes. So there were people... Involuntary. It's clearly a problem when people want to work and they can't. The, I'm, not, I'm not advocating this as a public policy position, but I'm trying to ex just explore the issue. It's clearly a problem if people say they want to work and they can't. Yep. It's less obviously a problem if people say they don't want to work and they don't. Well, they're getting to do what they want to do. So why do you call this... Why do you regard this as being such a crisis? Well, I, I guess it's, um, it, I see it as a kind of a multifaceted crisis. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it perforce is an underutilization of human potential. I think it's a kind of a humanitarian crisis. I also think it's kind of a moral crisis for the United States to have such a large share of the uh, prospective male uh, prime age population entirely out of the economy. Yeah, I, Larry, I think both of our, we want to look a little bit at the type of people who are out of work. Both of our focus is on what labor economists call prime age men, that's 25 to 54, and I'm very comfortable with that label at least for the next eight years of my life. <laughs> um, if you're looking at 16 I was much more comfortable with it 15 or 20 years ago. Um, if you're looking at a 16 year old, and they're in high school rather than a job, probably not a big public policy problem. I'd say the same thing about a 90-year-old who's retired. But you look at this age group, first of all, and then you look at the ones who aren't working. They're primarily with a high school degree or less. They're primarily not married to people who are working. So this isn't somebody who is taking care of their children or just did their IPO and wants to take a few years off. These are people who look like they either are in jobs that have low wages or they're out of a job. I agree our standard economic model has labor as a disutility. And you know, on the intensive margin, if you're deciding whether to work a few extra hours, that might be a reasonable thing. If you're in the workforce or not in the workforce, there's a lot of evidence that your self-esteem, your dignity, you know, your degree of happiness in the world depends a lot on whether you are, are participating in a job. But if your self-esteem is, so, just to develop the argument a little bit, if your self-esteem, your happiness, your dignity depend on having a job, why don't the people say they want a job? And why don't people look for, look for a job? I mean, after all, uh, there was a time when yeah people who had all kinds of disabilities worked. Right. And we would probably say that in a more humane society, some of those people aren't forced, uh, to, aren't forced to work. Or maybe to ask the question in a different way, um, I think the number is, and, and I've written like you guys have, that this is a crisis, that uh, 15% of men between the ages of 25 and 54 are not working. Um, for it not to be a crisis, would 15 have to be 10? Would 15 have to be eight? Would 15 have to be zero? What, what's the right number of men not working? In this prime age group. In this prime age group. The, the collapse, and it really has been a collapse over the post-war era in work rates for prime age guys, didn't really begin until the 1960s. 
The decline in uh, adult male work rates in the early post-war era was all early retirement for people 55 and older. Um, the drop for the, this 25 to 54 group didn't start until about 1965, around there. At that time, maybe six, six and a half percent were uh, not in jobs, which was about the same as in 1948 and 1955 and so forth. I think that that was kind of um, you know, a benchmark. There's also ways, I mean, there's a whole economics literature of addiction around things like smoking and the way your preferences change as a result of that. And you start smoking and you say what you're going to think a year from now and how you're going to behave a year from now, and then you get to a year from now and you behave quite differently. There may be some aspect of non-work that's consistent with that, that you just get more used to it and figure it out and have a harder time figuring out how to get into the workforce. There's a big debate as to whether this is supply or demand, and, and we'll probably get into that. In some sense, you know, I think a large part of it is lack of demand for these jobs, which we can talk more about. Um, but supply has to be, for the reason you just said, part of it. In some sense, somebody wanted a job at $60,000 a year. The only job available was $30,000 a year. He chose not to take that job and ends up a year later out of the workforce. We're going to move to, we're going to sort of structure this as describing the problem, which is what we're doing now, to explaining why the problem happened, to discussing what we're going to do about it. But just sticking with uh, the way you all have decided in your, in your work to describe the problem, I guess an obvious question that probably some people in the audience are wondering is, um, you regard men without work as a crisis. What about women without work? Um, are, there more, are there more men without work than women? Uh, do you think men being without work is a bigger problem? How do you think about this? Um, when you, how do you approach this in focusing on, uh, on men with, uh, and choosing as the focus here, men without work? I, I titled the book Men Without Work and focused on the men because the problem for the guys has been uh, germinating and gathering much longer than the problem for the girls, for the women. If you look at about the year 2000, you see a kind of an inflection. The work rates for women started to decline for the first time in the post-war era in 2000. So now we've got bad trends for both men and for women, but the absolute uh, notional <coughs> difference between, let's say, uh, 1965 era for guys in terms of the absolute difference in jobs for what we have today is larger than the absolute difference from the year 2000 versus today for females. And the thing for guys has just been going on a lot longer, half a century as opposed to 17 years. But yeah, the, um, the problem for work with women is real and getting increasingly acute. I haven't looked at that and I don't have as much of an understanding of the dynamics there. I mean, in some sense, I guess the question, I mean, I've, I have at some points made the same choice that you've made, but I've <coughs> wondered whether it's right. I mean, one, one possibility would be we had for reasons that are separate from the primary subjects of this panel, a set of changes in social attitudes and opportunities that led more women, particularly with women with children, to uh, decide to work. And so that produced from 1965 to 2000 an increase in the fraction of women who were working. But in terms of how well our society was functioning and our economy was functioning in preparing job, in providing jobs for people who wanted them and needed them. Perhaps there's an equal problem among women as among men, and it's just been made invisible by this other trend. I, I think there's a whole set of issues around women's labor force participation. And we did a lot of work on this also at the Council of Economic Advisors. 
Some of the problems between the two are common and similar. Some of the solutions are similar. Um, but there's obviously differences. And, and Nick pointed out that for men, you've seen a decline just like that from 1954 to the present. For women, you saw a big increase. And then you've seen a decline. If you compare women's labor force participation in the United States to other countries, most other countries have seen continued rises since 1990. I think just about all of them have. Whereas the United States, we've been, um, we've Outlier. declined since 1990. So it's become sort of we're ahead of everyone else and now are behind um, everyone else. I think to some degree, it's also a little bit e easier in some ways to focus on the men because you don't have to worry quite as much about some of the cultural changes and how you think about you know, families, taking care of families, division within households. And it gives you in some way a laboratory I think is relevant for women now and going forward. Part of the factors that have led, that we can study over 50 years for men, you only have 15 years for women. Um, I mean, I think there's an element, more. just to share my view. I, I, I'm not sure whether there is a bigger problem among men than there is among women. I think given the social conventions of our society over a long time period, there's in some ways less ambiguity for men Right. which makes it easier to study. If Ooh, exactly. a 45-year-old man is not working, there's kind of a general presumption that it's a problem. Whereas, given prevailing attitudes, at least through most of this period, one wouldn't want to be as confident that it was a problem in the case of, for example, a married woman with uh, children. Just one more thing on description. Uh, either one of you, say something about how the United States uh, fares relative to other countries on this metric of men, uh, men without work. You and if you look at the labor force participation rate, we basically have an annual competition with Italy for who can be the second lowest in the OECD. Um, neither one of us can compete with Israel because you have a lot of men there doing things like studying the Talmud, which are not classified. Um, as market work. The labor force participation rate makes it look a little bit worse because in other countries you might say you're unemployed to continue to collect unemployment insurance benefits. In the United States you won't do that because we're less generous. But still unemployment population, um, we're towards the bottom. The other thing is the delta here, the change from 1990 through 2015 is also the second worst in the OECD, and we've seen the second largest decline um, since 1990. So this is a problem um, that's affected every country, if you define the decline as a problem, but it's every country but Germany. Um, but it's affected the United States a lot more than everywhere else. Larry, one more point about men without work versus women without work. If you look at the time use surveys, you see a real different pattern of reported time use for the, guy, the prime age guys who are out of the labor force versus the uh, prime age girls who are out of the labor force. For women, 40% uh, are say they're out of the labor force because they're taking care of somebody. For the guys, uh, the fraction who report they're out of the labor force uh, because they're taking care of somebody is basically a rounding error. It's like 2.6%, something like that. When you look at what the guys report they're doing, they basically don't do civil society, they don't do religious activity, charities, volunteering, that sort of stuff. They don't do much of helping with kids uh, or helping with household chores, even though they do have a lot of time. Um, what they say they do is watch. They say they spend 2,100 hours a year watching TV, internet, uh, handheld devices, as if that's a, you know, almost like it's a full-time job. And that's different from the women who are out of the labor force. In fairness, I have a full-time job, but I might spend that much time a year on my handheld device. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you don't spend most of it playing video games, however. World of Warcraft. Or at least you wouldn't admit to it if you did. Um, a remark and then a and then a and then a question and then a uh, question. I actually think, for people like me, who tend to be very enthusiastic about the relative performance of the American uh, economy and tend to be very 
supportive of uh, the nature of American uh, capitalism. I actually think the most troubling fact is that with all our dynamism, our famous flexibility, all of that, the fraction, just to emphasize what these guys said, the fraction of men who are working between the ages of 25 and 54 is much lower than in most of sclerotic uh, Europe. And if one is tempted by things that say, just make everything more flexible and it will all be better, or just scale back all the social insurance and it will all be, uh, and it will all be uh, better. Uh, it is a troubling, it is a very troubling fact that we are well behind France on, uh, on this important uh, metric. Okay, we've described the, we've described the problem uh, a bit, and I think reading what you both have written, you're in substantial agreement on the description of the problem you're in some disagreement on um, the causes of the problem. So I'm just gonna say some words that you may want to incorporate in a discussion of causes. Uh, trade, technology, demand, benefits, disability, video games, crime, felony, uh, Cons military, uh, ex military experience, addiction, and culture. Um, we'll start with you, Jason. If you had to, um, <laughs> if you had to sort of explain why have we gone, why have we gone from five-ish to fifteen percent-ish on the change, and why are we so far south? of Europe on a seemingly important metric, what would your, how would you assess and explain the phenomenon? Right, so I'd organize my explanation into three buckets. The first is supply. That is these men choosing to work less. Mostly rule that out. One reason they could choose to work less is if they had a spouse that worked. That's not the case. Another reason could be if they're getting much more benefits. You have seen some increase in disability benefits. It's much less than the decline in men working. Moreover, all other form of cash benefits, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, traditional welfare, have actually declined for these men and more than offset the increase in disability, at least at the federal level. So it doesn't appear that it's just easier for you to get cash and not to work. So I don't place a lot of emphasis on supply, except insofar as there's this interaction between the two I mentioned. So the second is demand. There's been a large reduction in the demand for labor. You see that maybe that's because of trade, maybe that's because of technology, maybe that's because of immigration, maybe that's because of other things, but factory jobs, um, et cetera, less for all of that. And one thing you'd predict from a shock to demand is that you would see lower price and lower quantity, and that's what you see. Lower price is a lower wage for less skilled workers, and lower quantity is a lower labor force participation rate for less skilled workers, and you see that pattern broadly speaking, and you also, if you look at the pattern across states, you see states that have had a larger decline in wages, have had a larger increase um, in non-work. I don't think that demand shock, though, fully explains what we've seen, and the reason for that is that demand shock is pretty similar across a wide range of countries, but the pattern, both in terms of inequality and um, non-participation, has varied a lot, and as I said, was a lot worse in the United States. So I think there's something about American institutions. I think part of that is that we have flexible labor markets, but we don't have supportive labor markets that help connect people to jobs, whether through institutions like unions and work councils, or through active labor market policies that train people, help them find jobs. A second is our criminal justice system. We have a quarter of the world's prisoners here in the United States with 5% of the population. There's about 5 million prime age men that are ex-offenders, the 7 million of them out of the workforce. Um, it's a quantitatively large difference between us and Europe. And then something about our labor market, you said dyna dynamism and churn. 
we actually have less dynamism and churn than we used to, so it's a little bit easier to get stuck and become long-term unemployed, have to take a part-time job that you didn't want, or leave the workforce entirely. I don't think I fully understand that set of institutional explanations. You think if we had more them? dynamism, you, you think if we had more dynamism, we'd have a more favorable employment picture? I think in this respect we would. You look at something like the Great Recession, and you had, even for the large magnitude of increase in unemployment we had, we had an unusually large increase in people who were long-term unemployed, people who were working part-time for economic reasons, and dropping out of the workforce, three forms of labor market dysfunction. You look at the 2001 recession, that was a much milder increase in the unemployment rate, but scaled for that increase in the unemployment rate, all three of those labor market dysfunctions also were quite bad. I, you know, that is consistent with a world in which there's less churn in the labor market, so if you don't lose your job, you're fine. If you do lose your job, you're not rotating in and out as much anymore, and so you either get stuck, long-term unemployed, have to give up and take a job, or drop out of the workforce. So I think more, a healthier labor market with a bit more churn would create more opportunities I mean, for I guess people an to alternative, get back in. I guess an alternative interpretation that occurs to me is uh, maybe if you're incompetent in America, you get fired and you have a hard time finding a new job. But if you're incompetent in a place where it's less flexible, you sort of get carried along forever. And that becoming more dynamic and aggressive and all of that would actually be a negative from the point of view of this aspect of security. Yeah, I mean, Davis and Halty Wenger had the Jackson Hole paper about two years ago that had some empirical evidence that corresponded to this intuition that people could get more stuck in a labor market that had less fluidity. Um, but, you know, and, and Denmark, it's easy to fire people that they have a lot more training, a lot more job search assistance. They spend 2% of their GDP as opposed to our 0.2% of GDP. Nick, I think you have tended to put somewhat more emphasis on the supply side. We'll, we'll get, to the, get to the criminal justice aspects with both of you uh, in, a, uh, in, a few, in a few minutes. Um, but you have put, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say, uh, rather more emphasis on, uh, the, on, uh, on the supply side mm -hmm. and in your writings more broadly um, on issues relating to dependency. It's even been suggested that you might have been a partial inspiration for some of Mitt Romney's comments so uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that sphere, which probably weren't overwhelmingly popular in this building. Um, but um, do you want sure. to make, talk, about the, talk about the importance of the yeah. supply side? All of your prompts ring true to me, and all of Jason's analysis rings true to me. The question is how much weight we attribute to the demand the supply and the institutional barriers, the question of weighting these different factors. So it's, it's obviously the case that in all of the rich countries we've had this decline in prime male uh, labor force participation rates since the 1960s. So there's something common to all of the countries and whether that's the decline of manufacturing and outsourcing and trade and all of that, I mean, there's a very plausible, I think, narrative there. Um, what, we, what we can't explain offhand from that is why the U.S. looks so very bad compared to these other countries, and you offered one hypothesis for it, that you know, um, adults get fired easier in the United States or whatever than in uh, Japan. Um, maybe that's true, um, but I can see some other things which um, make it more difficult for me to put uh, most weight on the demand side in this narrative story. For one thing, if you look at the uh, inactivity rates, the flip side of the labor force participation rates, the proportion of guys out of the labor force, it's almost a straight line from 1965 to the present. Um, 
You can't tell when the recessions were. You can't tell when the Great Recession was. You can't see business cycles. It's, uh, I mean, for the social sciences, it's uh, almost a straight line. It's remarkably straight. Uh, for another thing, when you look at some of the, um, some of the most disadvantaged groups, uh, let's say like men who don't have high school degrees, you have really disparate performance in the labor force depending upon other characteristics. Guys who are married but don't have a high school degree in this prime group are basically indistinguishable from college grads and their labor force participation rates. Um, so there's a heterogeneity in there that's kind of interesting. Um, when we look at, uh, the U.S. does a miserable job on collecting data at the federal level on the archipelago of disability insurance programs that we finance. The closest thing that I've been able to find to a kind of a source for this is one of the Census Bureau surveys, the SIP survey, Survey of Income and Program Participation. That survey suggests that about not quite three-fifths of the um, of the guys out of the labor force around 2013, the latest wave I could get, were uh, participating in at least one of the disability programs. And since, given the way these things work, that's probably an underreport and an undercorrection of the actual level. Um, that doesn't say that uh, our uh, wildly generous disability insurance program, which it is not, has generated this uh, situation. But it does say that it's financing this alternative. What fraction of the, so, so the thing I was sort of wondering about as I listened to kind of both of you yeah. was, um, yeah, there's disability insurance and there's more disability yeah. insurance, but Jason rightly yeah. points out that there's less UI and workman's compensation. Yeah. How do we think these people are living? And what about the theory that there's more activity off the books than there used to be? And so Did the people kind of are working, yeah. but there's more off the books activity that just shows up as inactivity. So I tried to find whatever I could find that measured that. First of all, the cross country data is incredibly clear that there's a lot more of that in Europe than there is in the United States where you have higher tax rates and more regulation. So the cross national fact that I said before, that puzzle is compounded by this observation. Um, I found two time series estimates for the United States, both expressing it as a share of GDP, so not a share of workers, both roughly constant um, as a share of GDP. One was, I think, the OECD. I can't remember um, who did the other one. So this is certainly possible. Um, there's no doubt that this is part of what's going on there. There's not evidence, at least coming from the GDP side, that it explains the trend, and certainly not that it explains the, the cross-national variation. So how are all these people living? I mean, what's our, what for, I mean, just, just, just to calibrate it, according to your data when you, when you look at it, if you take the 25 to 54-year-old men who are, let's say, who are non-participants, since that's, to leave out the unemployed. Yep. According to your estimates, from what you guys are able to track officially, um, what, fr what fraction of them are getting at least $2,000 a month from some government program? Oh, I thought you were going to ask any cash, because that's 41%. The 2,000 or more, I can give you the answer tomorrow. Um, it used to be about two-thirds were getting cash assistance. Now it's down to 40%. So Some 40%, are, so 60% getting zero. A zero federal cash assistance. There's more getting SNAP and Medicaid than that. For the non oh, sorry. it's Medicaid is what it sounds like, which is, your cheap, which is uh, free health care. And SNAP is what was once called food stamps. 
It's a, it's a different, I mean, you get different results if you look at different uh, surveys from the Census Bureau. You, I mean, if, if you look at the one that's designed for measuring program participation as opposed to CPS for employment and income, I, I don't want to kill us with nerddom, but you get, it, you get a somewhat different uh, view if you, it looks a little more like that if you look at uh, the SIP survey. It also depends very much on your uh, educational uh, attainment. Now, the guys who are out of, uh, out of the labor force and don't have a high school degree, about 75% report that they're in one or more disability programs, and about 80% are in SNAP. And importantly here, uh, about over two-thirds are in Medicaid, the low-income health care program. And that's terribly important because Medicaid horribly and unintentionally became a sort of a gateway for the opioid explosion. Uh, for the what explosion? For the opioid explosion. Oh. Because you could get a, uh, in much of the country, uh, with the revolution in pain pill factories, uh, you could get a script for OxyContin for a month for 90 pills for a Medicaid $3 copay. And so looking at the Medicaid part of it, I mean, that, that doesn't show up as a monetized benefit, but that's also significant. It does sound there. like there's a, it does sound like there's a bit of a remaining puzzle here, because listening to you guys, it <coughs> sounds to me like if I sort of said, you know, it's great to be on Met, well, not great, but there's a lot of benefit to being on uh, Medicaid, but if you just said, on the basis of the benefits we're successfully tracking, could a single person live, could a single male live in an American metropolitan area or an American town, it doesn't sound like the answer's yes, for anything like 100% of the people we're identifying. Well, if, you, if you look, again, you know, we've got this Rashomon thing going with the different surveys that we look at. If we look at the consumer expenditure survey, which doesn't look at what people uh, say they're earning, but says, it looks at what they say they're spending, at what their spending power is, the, uh, the NILF men, the guys who are not in the labor force in this uh, prime uh, age group, 25 to 54, look as if they're not in the bottom quintile. They're in the second quintile. Um, that's not a great place to be. It's better than being in the bottom quintile. Um, and that's, that's, not all, that's not all government benefits. That's family income. That's girlfriend income, the other household member income, too. That's interesting. I'm going to open this up in just a couple minutes, so people should be thinking about uh, questions. But uh, maybe and this will, you may want to fold your views on criminal, more of your views on criminal justice into your answer here. Uh, maybe I'll ask you this first, Nick. Uh, if you were. The president, if, if a president of the United States said, I'm going to have three priorities in my administration, and one of them is, I believe in work, and I want, I want, to, have, I want to go back to having everybody who should be working, working like we used to, and I'm sure we have a problem with 25 to 54-year-old men. I imagine we have a problem with some other groups, but I want to make more working a centerpiece of my, uh, of my administration. I'll spend heavy political capital on it. I'll give instructions to my cabinet to do things. I'll convene businesses in the White House if you tell me to. But I want to know what my, what my less than five point plan is. Um, okay. What would you tell the President of the United States? Okay. Well, so not even President Trump can fix the family in America. I think that's kind of outside of his scope. If we had a 1965 family structure, about half of the um, inactivity rate would probably decline, uh, disappear. So in the world of the doable, uh, much more on training people. That's a strong, just to check, mm -hmm. we won't debate it, but yeah. that's a that's a statement that reflects a judgment that um, being single and without responsibility contributes to your not having a job no. to an important extent rather than not having a job contributes to your being single. Well, let me, let me uh, do a redirect. 
if we had the uh, same proportions of married, widowed, uh, divorced, and never married that we had in 1965, and it applied it to the work rate and the out of labor force uh, rates today, you'd, right. that wouldn't be by half. Okay, fine. Uh, better put then. Um, so, uh, job, uh, job and skills training, especially for people who uh, don't, have, uh, don't have college degrees. Um, something, I don't know what, to revitalize a small business to get us away from the net business death environment that we had for, uh, for a number of years around the Great Recession and thereafter. Uh, a work first principle uh, in, our, in revamping disability insurance, a little bit like some of the Nordics uh, we have, that might be more expensive. Um, but really, uh, the, the thing which I don't think we've talked nearly enough about is the roughly 20 million men and women, overwhelmingly men, uh, who are not behind bars but have uh, felony convictions in their backgrounds in America today. That's like one in eight adult men. And if there were one thing, uh, my comparative advantage, my contribution would be, I'd ask the, uh, the president to start collecting the data, the socioeconomic data, employment, income, program participation, health, mental health, living arrangements, you know, all of that stuff on the 20 million people who've got a felony in their background and are currently kind of invisible. The president's political advisors would no doubt be incredibly excited by a recommendation that he used his State of the Union to call for data collection and would <laughs> gravitate, to, would resonate to yeah. that with, uh, with great strength. Jason, how would you answer the question? Yeah. I mean, on, on that last one, I have to say anyone who's tried to figure out the contribution that criminal justice um, has made to this, really frustrating that you don't have the data that matches up people's background in terms of you know, felony convictions, imprisonment, with what their status is today. There's nothing that does that, and we're left with some really rough proxies to try to figure that question out. Um, that being said, you know, I'll go back to, first of all, the set of policies that I don't even know if they're primarily motivated by this, but they'd help a lot. So education and then the facts um, left out one really important fact, which is in the 1960s, the labor force participation rate was roughly unrelated to your degree of education. It was about 98, 97%, whether you were a high school degree or less or a college degree or more. Everyone's declined, but the main decline has been in the high school or less. So more education would help with this, would help with inequality, would help with economic growth, and you know, is part of the answer. Um, criminal justice reform, I think probably it's pr not necessarily primarily because of this. I think there's a whole lot of reasons to support it, but I would include this one on the list. Going back to my diagnosis of the problem, if part of the problem is a decline in the demand for these types of men, then expanding demand, so investing more in infrastructure, creating more of the types of job opportunities that can employ people that you know, didn't get that college degree would be number one. Number two would be more of what I was calling active labor market policies. We spend um, the 22nd most as a share of our GDP in the OECD, where um, you know, Chile and Mexico are the only countries that spend less than us. A lot of those programs don't work well, but there's a lot of evidence around training programs, community college, that does work well. There were evaluations of job search assistance in UI, and it actually saved money because people found jobs sooner and we didn't pay them. Um, the unemployment insurance. The harder case is um, you know, people, especially older workers, who lose a job. They're not going to be retrained. They're not going to find another job for the same wage. Um, a proposal that's been around for a while called wage insurance that says rather than just giving you insurance if you're not working, that you know, if you're making $60,000 a year, all you can find is a new job at $35,000 a year will provide you insurance, will make up some of the difference between the two of those for some period of time um, for older workers. And then the last question is whether we need to be thinking more seriously about um, subsidies for work. The evidence for the earned income tax credit for families with children is very strong. Um, you get 40 cents on the dollar for every dollar you earn if you have two children, 45 cents if you have three or more children. 
And um, we have one for people without children, but it's minuscule and no one really knows they get it until TurboTax gives them the pleasant surprise um, or, the, or, or h and Block at the end of the year, um, expanding that quite a lot and having subsidies to reward work um, I think would be a good idea. The one thing I think would be a bad idea is something like universal basic assistance, um, UBI, which I think basically gives up on solving this problem rather than asking what we can do to solve it and help people prepare for jobs, find jobs, and make it um, profitable for employers to hire them. How do you square your view that it, your enthusiasm for the EITC, which I to some extent share, with your view that it's a demand side, much more a demand side problem rather than a supply side problem, since the EITC doesn't give your employer anything for hiring you, it just kind of gives you money for her doing it. And so how can you believe that the EITC is super potent without believing that the supply side is a very important piece of this? I mean, two things. One is um, some of the incidents of the EITC in terms of who actually gets it is employers. Insofar as more people are working, wages can go down and employers can save money on hiring people. And Jesse Rothstein in a calibrated model that one, one could debate found that, that was about 25%. A lot on the progressive side have used that as an argument against the minimum wage. They've said the minimum wage, uh, as in against the EITC. They said the EITC benefits employers. Why would you want to give it to them? This is the classic argument that you know, Walmart benefits from things like food stamps because they don't need to pay people as much. Um, I view that as potentially a positive thing if it makes it cheaper to hire people and you hire more of them. It's a subsidy for hiring low-income um, workers. The second is, you know, even if the decline wasn't caused by a withdrawal of supply, that doesn't say that one of the tools that we don't have at our disposal to change it would be to increase supply. So our solutions don't need to match up exactly with our problems. Just I want to help support my argument that I do. Okay, we are going to open this up. Um, I think there are a standard set of Kennedy School admonitions at this point, which I will phrase this way. It's called question period rather than questions period. So that means you're only supposed to ask one. And it's called question period, and questions, questions end with a question mark. Uh, rather than with a statement. So the floor is open and people who want to ask a question should go to one of the, should go, should line up at one of the microphones of which there are four. One on this side, one on that side, and up above. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Yep. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, some of the challenges with job training programs that we see where you know, people lose a job where they're making, say, 50K, and then they stay out of work for a year or two, and, you know, their health indicators decline, and their employability declines, and then so they finally sign up for a job training program after several years, but they're already on this kind of downward spiral. Uh, and, and so some of the studies we've done on jobs training programs show that they're not effective, perhaps, for that reason. Do you have any thoughts on how to improve job training programs or, or those kinds of things to help people get back into meaningful work? Yeah, I mean, you can divide these programs into are they for disadvantaged workers or dislocated workers, and are they for young or for older. And in that sort of four by four matrix, there's a whole set of programs that have been studied and evaluated in each of those buckets. Um, the ones for older have been more challenging than the ones for younger, and the ones for um, disadvantaged have tended to be more challenging than the ones for dislocated. Um, community colleges have been you know, one of the more effective ones that those are more effective at an, you know, at an earlier stage um, in your life. And, um, but, you know, and I, and I think there's a lot more that we need to learn about. I think part of the problem, and we didn't discuss this at all, is the cross-national, I think, is not just what we spend on programs, but also the types of labor market institutions that you have, the ways in which, and, and Europe has you know, more of an insider, outsider labor market. If you're on the insider, it works really well for you and it helps protect you in jobs and move you into a next one. And 
you know, economists used to be quite negative about that. Maybe there's actually um, some benefit to that. Also, um, and I should have put on the list, apprenticeships is something that there is um, an increasing amount of evidence and enthusiasm uh, for. Uh, I'll just say I'm a little more, I don't disagree with anything Jason said, but at least my reaction to this is that if you do the simple thing, which is you look at a bunch of people who are in training programs and then you look at people who weren't in the training programs, in general, one's less over, there are obviously some successes, but in general, one's less overwhelmed by the difference. And I've always had the suspicion that even if you were able to show that people who were in training programs did lots better than people who weren't in training programs, it doesn't follow that putting everybody in a training program will make everybody much better off. It might just be that the people who are in the training programs were first in line for the, for the still, find, still limited number of jobs, and there's even some evidence from France uh, in support of that view. Yeah. Hi, good evening. My name is John, and I'm a master's student here. I had a question uh, that was building upon your question, Professor Summers, about the EITC with respect to uh, the uh, long-run participation rate of males being a demand problem. Um, minimum wage, there's been a huge support for raising the minimum wage, a federal minimum wage, to $15. Um, and I was wondering whether um, you thought, if you think that that would exacerbate the existing problem or whether um, on that that would lead to an increased supply of workers entering the labor force. Nick, Jason? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> So our, um, our real minimum wage uh, today is way lower than our real minimum wage was back in 1965 when we had a much happier portrait. Um, <clears throat> and we're a much more affluent society now and average income levels are much higher than they were. Um, I have a, uh, I get a headache when I try to think about this, so maybe you should ask uh, Larry or Jason because it's not just the wage that's paid, it's its interaction with other benefits which determine the actual take home benefits for a prospective worker. And I'm not real good on that. Uh, it, it, it's, it seems to me it's a much more complicated uh, supply and demand thing that you might think if the only part of the package were the wage itself. But I defer to you guys about that. Yeah. So I mean, so my view on this is there's two ways you could think about the labor market. One is supply and demand. And in a world of supply and demand and competitive markets, if you raise the minimum wage, you'll have more involuntary unemployment. There's a lot of micro studies of increases in minimum wage that don't seem to match that model. Nick just gave you some pretty casual evidence that also doesn't match it. Um, the cross-country evidence also doesn't. Our minimum wage is the single lowest in the OECD relative to, I think it's relative to median wages or average wages. Um, and we have this participation problem that others don't have. There's another model of labor markets, which is more of a monopsony, which is sort of the opposite of monopoly, or, or sort of like monopoly, but you have one buyer instead of one seller. And that says in each labor market interaction, there's basically some surplus that's created. You would have been happy to work at $8. They would have been happy to pay you $15. Where the wage ends up between those two is a matter of bargaining, the strength of unions, minimum wage laws, et cetera and that you can actually raise the wage within that region, you might get more labor supply, more people want to work at a higher wage, and it's still worth hiring them because you are willing to pay them more, and so you could actually get you know, some increase in employment when the wage goes up. I think there's some evidence for that being the case. I think there is no evidence that that is the case going all the way up to $15 an hour, and personally, I guess there's a year in which I'd be comfortable at $15 an hour um, in nominal terms, but um, not anything in the next couple of years. I think the evidence would make me a lot more comfortable with a minimum wage, um, but with, with raising the minimum wage, but not as high as that. Yeah. Hi. Um, um, uh, I'm a master's student here at Harvard, so um, I also have a question about um, in, like, um, income. So we already know that with um, technology and such stuff, like um, a massive unemployment is like um, an inevitable trend in the future. 
And also there's um, another concept, um, the universal basic income has been always half its supporters, like from Martin Luther King to uh, Milton Friedman, um, and from some European countries like Finland has already had some experiments, and from uh, Y Combinator as uh, Silicon Valley has already conducted experiments in Oakland. So do you think like um, something like a universal basic income support is doable in the States or in or more in general, like other parts of the world, um, or is it just like a fantasy or something? Thanks. I think that uh, the Jason uh, debated and won on this question just a little while ago, and uh, I'm kind of on the same side as Jason is. I'm skeptical of the universal uh, basic income, uh, possibly for different reasons from you. Uh, my reservation, I can see in a world of prospective mass labor displacement, driverless trucks, uh, artificial intelligence accountants, and who knows what else that may be coming down the road. I can see why people may uh, focus on this and think about it a lot. The, um, to my way of thinking, the big problem about universal basic income is that it isn't connected to work and to employment because I see characteristic differences between guys who are entirely out of the labor force and guys who are unemployed but looking for a job. And there's a fair amount of, uh, of survey data to suggest that the, uh, the guys who are out of the, uh, out of the labor force entirely uh, are not as happy, are more troubled, it may be a cause and effect sort of question there. Uh, being in the labor force, I think, gets you towards having a vocation and towards having a kind of like a more positive uh, interaction with society as a whole. You may have different reasons for being for UBI. I, I just very briefly, first of all, it's a term that people use for a lot of things. So if you're talking about unconditional cash transfers, to poor villagers in Kenya, um, that may very well be a good thing to do. There's a certain amount of growing evidence for that approach. But if you look at the experiments going on in places like that, they go to everyone in a village. The village is a poor village, everyone's poor, so it's not really universal. Um, you look at Finland, the UBI there is, um, it's an unemployment benefit, but rather than get it weekly, as long as you're unemployed, you get a lump sum. That's not universal, that's for people who are um, unemployed. So people have used this word for a lot of different things. If you define it in the, you know, everyone in the country gets $12,000 and will end poverty and make everyone happy forever vein, which is, I think, the way it's been in the United States. I think it's tough. I actually agree with Nick's diagnosis. I think you also look at the numbers and either they don't add up because you've created something that costs three times more than Social Security that would require you to double our income taxes to pay for, or you make the numbers add up by giving people that money and then just taking back the same amount from most of them in taxes, in which case, you know, why did you just do the, the whole thing? I actually, I see, I see Doug, Dean Elmendorf here. I think the Kennedy School ought to include in its curriculum uh, somewhere an exercise where students are asked to think about and design a hypothetical universal benefit, universal basic income, because I think they'd find it illuminating as to the trade-offs involved. And I think a minor bout with arithmetic would operate to substantially reduce enthusiasm. Um, here's just a simple fact. Suppose you wanted to give every adult in the United States $20,000. And by the way, you sort of have to deal with adults individually or you'll encourage, if you say $20,000 a family, everybody will get divorced and become two families. So you, you sort of have to do it that way. 20,000 times uh, 200 million, unless I've misdone my arithmetic, which I don't think I have, is $4 trillion. That is a number substantially in excess of the current federal budget. So you'd have to double every tax in order to do it. So you'll say, okay, well, we're not gonna do that. I got a good idea. We'll just phase it out. And so we'll, you only get the $20,000 if you're poor. But of course, if you do that, let's say you're gonna add a third to the tax rate for people. Um, so what then happens is you get $20,000 if you have a zero income and it phases out and you lose 33 cents for every dollar you earn. 
Well, that means there are going to be a lot of people with $50,000 who are going to have 33% higher tax rates than they did before. And if you think that's not going to affect uh, their behavior, well, then you think very differently than I do. Um, and so I think that it is, I think anyone who wants to say they're for a universal basic income should be required to sketch in broad terms how, how much they want it to be, how really universal it wants to be, how you really universal it wants to be, and how roughly speaking they want to pay for it. And I think when you do that, you are extreme, you are almost everyone who goes through that exercise, they may still be for it, but they will end up much less enthusiastic about it than they were before they confronted uh, the income. Uh, I think probably in some ways one of the most thoughtful advocates of a version of a universal uh, basic income is Nick's colleague at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, Charles Murray. But if you look at his universal basic income, a key sentence is, we're going to get rid of all the government's existing social welfare activities to finance the universal income for everybody. Well, that's fine if you've got a theory as to what's going to happen to the people who now get Medicaid and what's going to happen to the people who now get a variety of targeted and specialized government benefits. So the proposition about which I'm certain is that thinking about this requires a confrontation with arithmetic. And the proposition about which I'm fairly certain, but less certain, is that when people engage with the arithmetic, their enthusiasm will diminish substantially. Uh, hi. For Dr. Eberstadt, uh, is there support in the OECD uh, data for the connection you suggested between family structure and labor force participation outside of the U.S.? <clears throat> Not, uh, there, is a, there is a general tendency, but not as strong as in the U.S. itself. I think one can see it, uh, one can see it to some degree everywhere, but the U.S., I think, is a more acute case. Yes, sir. I'm Tony Morris. I'm a member of the Dean's Council at the Harvard Kennedy School. I raised the question as to whether or not there's a role for broader tax policy in these discussions. Uh, Capital and technology are near cousins. Uh, technology and labor compete. Um, higher returns to labor might draw more supply. Tax policy today uh, subsidizes technology far more than it subsidizes labor, leading to actually a competition, a, a wage competition, or a depressing uh, wages. And it's not so clear today as it was maybe in the past uh, those 50 years ago that capital investment actually creates jobs. The equation has been changed. So uh, maybe there's a, an opportunity to uh, get more labor if it's tax less and maybe less wage competition if capital isn't subsidized uh, the way it is. So I just raised that question. I, uh, I think this problem to a first approximation appears to be unrelated to productivity growth. Nick described that line straight down. Some of that was during periods of high productivity growth. Some of that was during periods of low productivity growth. You know, one of the you know, amazing periods of productivity growth was what Larry oversaw as Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration. Um, but in the year 2000, the employment population ratio for prime age men still hadn't recovered from the shallow recession nine years earlier in 1991. We had the same problem in our administration with um, less than stellar Productivity growth would be the polite term for it. Um, so I think it's largely unrelated. Um, I think more productivity growth would be a very good thing for other reasons, because I think all else being equal, that would mean you'd have higher wages and higher income. So a tax system that would encourage, um, to some degree, more investment, but also better quality investment, allocating capital in a more efficient manner, um, including towards innovation, I think would actually be a good thing, um, not a bad thing. I think it would lead to higher wages and largely not affect um, employment. You have um, surprising and good company. Bill Gates uh, advocated recently a robot tax on essentially the, gra essentially the grounds uh, that, you, that you 
uh, if you explained, uh, I have a blog which is easy to find on the internet, taking, uh, yeah, taking rather strong issue um, with his advocacy, essentially on the grounds that how do you know what types of technology are going to replace labor, maybe Windows replaced a lot of assistants working in offices and so should it be taxed separately and expressing a general philosophical view that creating a bigger pie and then figuring out how to make sure everybody gets a piece is a better idea than trying to discourage the growth uh, in the size of the pie. But that would be the area one would look. I'll just use your question as a vehicle to comment um, that if anybody here, if you ask like, what would I like to write, read an economics paper that explains a lot of things, but probably none than a compelling explanation of why on the one hand, there's a sense that there's more technology displacing more jobs than ever before or than usual. And at the same time, productivity, which is output per person, is growing extraordinarily slowly. And how one would reconcile those two large perceptions is a question that I don't think has been answered. Uh, I mean, I, there are various hypotheses, but I don't think any convincing answer has been provided. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm Daniel from the uh, Business School. This is almost exactly my question, but maybe then one related add-on to it. What, what are specific policies that we could think about if we, we think about this technological disruption that could still make sure that we have a, a large middle class? Because I think that's one of the big things that a lot of Americans are worried about right now. I mean, I'm, you know, to some degree worried that we're having too little technological disruption. If you look at the economy over the last decade, we've had pretty decent job growth. We've had um, pretty disappointing GDP growth. And the difference between those is that the amount you're producing per hour um, hasn't been going up very much over the last year. It's about six tenths, um, you know, of a percent. So I think all things being equal, having more of that would be good. Um, but it wouldn't be unqualifiedly good. I think it would be you know, a problem I would love to have, but it would come with a set of side effects of um, potentially greater inequality if that technology complemented people with skills. Although you know, you know, Uber and Lyft may be an example of a technology that's actually complementing people you know, who are less skilled and raising their earnings possibilities. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then this labor force participation problem has been you know, as I said, sort of you've been having it when you have fast productivity growth and slow productivity growth, certainly that churn is playing a role in it. So I think, you know, more disruption would be a good thing, but we should figure out how to handle some of the side effects associated with it better. You can't, you can't directly uh, link technological displacement to geographic and labor force mobility, but over the past 30 plus years, there has been a marked decline in geographic mobility for adults and for everybody in the United States. Uh, there's also, uh, low, although rates have come up since the depths of the Great Recession, there are markedly lower quits rates today than there were in the year 2000. And I agree with, um, I agree with Jason that having more churning on balance might be better for the economy and the society than having everybody more or less trapped in place. I see three more people at microphones. I'm going to let them each ask their questions, and then I'm going to let, uh, starting with uh, Jason, I'm going, to let I'm going to let our speakers respond uh, to uh, the questions as a group and say anything final that they want to say. Yes. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the different patterns for participation in wages. So you both noted that the participation rate 
has fallen steadily since the 1950s. Um, and yet, during the 60s and 70s, wages for prime age men were rapidly increasing uh, and have then since fallen uh, after 1970. So I'm curious how you uh, sort of reconcile those two different patterns. Oh, I, I'm answering first, right. Okay, so um, qualitative, I'll, you know, I'll be the first to admit that I spend less time using that as a research tool, and I think I am worse off for it and understand less because of it. Certainly, there's been a number of books written recently, you know, Hillbilly Elegy being the one that sold the best of them that have given you um, more of that perspective. I think your nurse's example um, is a good one, and it gets to that you can't fully disentangle supply and demand. There may be a demand shock that you know such and such job disappears, but there's still job openings in something else, and you don't want that other job because you think you can do better, or you want a job that you know has a different name attached to it, or has a different wage, or something else. I think culture could be part of that. So I think that probably is a part of it. I don't know. Good. There's some evidence on the expectation. Um, and to um, you know, John's question, and I should say John uh, was a critical part of CEA's report on this and thought more about this topic than probably anyone else um, in this room and was polite enough to phrase this thing as a question rather than a speech. Um, but uh, you know, I think that's it's a bit vexing. I mean, but, you know, as Nick said, you have something that's a straight line. Everything else, thing, the other thing we point to isn't a straight line says probably there's different causes for this at different periods of time, and it's just sort of, at this point it was this, at that point it was that. Um, something was netting out. The fact that you see the demand in the cross-sectional evidence across states makes me put, um, you know, have some degree of confidence that, um, you know, it's part of the story, but, you know, I agree the story's probably gonna be different for different periods of time and in some more nuanced way than we've probably done justice to on stage today. I, I very much agree with what Jason just said. Amen Corner on J.D. Vance and Hillbilly Elegy. I wish we had 100 J.D. Vances around the country in different communities and different places. Uh, it would be nice to see uh, more people doing the sort of stuff that Elliot Lebo did uh, two generations ago in Tally's Corner. You don't have to be anthropologists, <laughs> you can be human beings. I mean, you, just, you need a human empathy to kind of explain the human story and maybe you could do something more effective in the policy realm with that. Um, with respect to uh, mail work, construction, uh, manufacturing, it's kind of curious that the proportion of manufacturing jobs have declined so similarly in countries like Canada, the US, France, Australia, and you've had such very different uh, outcomes in terms of labor force participation for guys. It's part of the story for sure, but there's something else going on. And you know, when, when we think about the 60s and 70s versus today, I mean, if you think about the national uh, labor force, or think, if you presume there is a national labor force in the United States, you might think that there would be uh, a tendency towards equilibrium after shocks. One of the things that I was really puzzled by in my own homework was how the differences in uh, inactivity rates for men uh, between states steadily increased across the country uh, from the 70s to the present, and how the differences between states that were contiguous to one another tended to increase. I mean, think right up here, one of the states with the highest inactivity rates is Maine, and as I remember from third grade, the only land border that Maine has in the U.S. is New Hampshire, which has one of the lowest uh, inactivity rates. That's increased over time. There are obviously explanations for it, but it's vexing to see why these um, curious trends have continued and why we've had this almost straight line in national increases in male inactivity for the uh, prime age working guys over the last half century. Let me just say uh, in conclusion um, that what I found inspiring about Jason and Nick 
was, of course, uh, the way in which they analyzed a very, very important uh, social uh, problem. But the way in which uh, they calmly and with evidence looked at different perspectives on an important issue with a view that better understanding it could contribute to better solutions. And it seems to me that that's the kind of thing that a university like ours needs to stand for. And it seems to me that that's a thing that, I don't know about long-term trends, but there's probably been some shorter-term trend towards the desire to look at facts, analysis, and evidence having been in decline uh, in our country. And that makes the kind of work that they both are doing uh, that much more important. I know I speak for all of us in thanking uh, Jason Furman and Nick Everstadt for being with us tonight.